This video is sponsored by Wicked Warlock Candles. How do you cultivate an atmosphere at a D&D table? What can you change or add to your gaming space to help build immersion? That's what we're talking about today. And first of all, I want to be clear. You don't have to worry about creating atmosphere. This is one of those things that's easier to do if you're the one hosting the game, and this may not just be something you want to spend any energy on. My first GM never worried about the atmosphere of our games at all. He would employ almost none of the techniques on our list, except for handouts, and he ran his games for us for like nine years and we never complained. You don't really need to cultivate an atmosphere. But if you can, then that can be really wonderful. It can add to the experience through immersion. Now, look, I know immersion is sometimes just a buzzword that doesn't seem to mean anything. I watched the new Jenny Nicholson video too. And I know that when you're running a D&D game, you're unlikely to fool your friends into actually believing they're in the depths of a dwarven mine or in an elven forest or even just in a fantasy tavern. However, if you can cultivate an atmosphere that is unlike the usual environment where you and your friends hang out and watch TV or play board games, then you can basically create an atmosphere that gives your friends permission to play in the space. It tells your players that you put some time and attention toward giving them a special experience, one they can't get from their other hobbies. And I believe that that can help get them into the right mindset to take the world of the game seriously, because they know that you put some energy into it. The goal is to create an atmosphere that draws a clear demarcation between your daily lives and your time playing the game. In Pointy Hat's video about in-person versus online play, he talked about the ritual of lighting a candle when it's time to start playing the game. This helps everyone at the table understand that it's time to stop talking about their day jobs and the latest Star War, and time to sit at the table and put their attention on the game. And ever since I heard that piece of advice, I've wanted to employ it at my own tables. And as I'm getting ready to start running in-person games again, hopefully very soon, I'm looking at the techniques we're discussing in this video as potential ways to cultivate a much more deliberate atmosphere during my games. And this video was actually commissioned by Wicked Warlock, which is a company that makes candles specifically for your fantasy games. They reached out and asked me to talk about their candles, and they felt this topic lined up really well with what they hope to accomplish through their products. And we'll talk a little bit later in this video about how you can use these candles to enhance the atmosphere in your games. But let's actually start with the number one thing you need if you're going to build the atmosphere at your D&D table. Privacy. Now you don't need privacy to play D&D. People play in game stores and on convention floors all the time. For my first campaign, we played with the dorm room door wide open so anybody who walked past could just stop by and chat about whatever. And those games were still a ton of fun. But those were environments where it's really challenging to control the atmosphere in any meaningful way. If you want to curate a specific ambiance, you're going to want some privacy. Ideally, you can find somewhere that you have full control over the space, like your kitchen or your dorm room, or if you're a bit younger, your mother's basement. It's a cliche for a reason. It's a good place to shut away a lot of the outside world and all the distractions that come with it. Now, one of the conditions of shutting out distractions includes watching out for distractions that come from inside the house. You might have roommates or family members living with you who aren't part of your game, and if you're playing someplace like a kitchen, then it's possible someone will wind up walking through the space to get some food. And like, let's be clear. You can't ask your roommate or your partner or your family members to just not use the kitchen while you have people over just because that's the room that has the best table for playing D&D. So in those cases, it's sort of inevitable that someone could walk through while you're right in the middle of your adventure. We got a great weekend. Just our gang, just us. Hey, hey. Hey, bro. I'm not here. Who's that? That's Daryl. He's, he's just staying here. He's going through some things, but he's not part of the experience at all. However, if your roommate or whoever knows some of your players, you may want to make sure that they also know that the middle of the game is the wrong time to catch up with them and ask how their day's been and did they hear back from the doctor, etc. It's one thing for someone to walk through and say, good luck guys, or are you winning kids? But it's another to interrupt a tense combat or an important role-playing scene and say, oh my gosh, Casey, did you catch the latest episode of Doctor Who? Thankfully, there are two easy ways to combat this sort of interruption. The first is to set expectations with all involved, your roommates or family members, whoever you share the space with, and your players. If you're expecting your players to keep their attention on the game, then they all need to know that. Second, you should make sure your players and your roommates or whoever will get a chance to catch up socially. Let them know that they could catch up during your bio breaks or ask them to set time aside before or after the game where they can spend some time together. That way, if you get them to agree to a dedicated time where they can hang out, then you should be able to get them to agree to respect the sanctity of the game session itself. Now, if you or your fellow players don't have the freedom of a private space as part of where any of you live, you can still track down some options. Your local library probably rents out study rooms, and as long as you respect the noise requirements and keep to your allotted time, that could be a great place to run games. If you play with coworkers, play in the break room on your lunch break or in the conference room after work. I once rented a room in a dance studio for a friend's birthday D&D session, and while it was a bit pricey to make a habit out of that for a weekly campaign, it was a great place to run a game for a special occasion. If you've got a bit of control over the space, then that gives you the freedom to try our next technique, lighting. 
Now, by no means am I suggesting you should go buck wild with the lighting to the point where it's distracting. Likewise, you don't want to reduce the lighting too much because unless you're playing 10 candles or maybe dread, then the players are going to need lights to see their character sheets. But some small accent lights can help draw focus to the parts of your environment that you want to highlight. For example, if you have a bookcase in the room where you play, then some LED lights like these can do a nice job of making these books look dramatic. And especially if you've got your gaming books on display, it's really nice to accentuate them and give them a bit of extra emphasis. On the other hand, if you're playing next to a glass cabinet that has like your wedding china in it, then there's no need to add dramatic lighting for the purposes of enhancing the experience of your D&D game. That's not really going to jive with that. And when in doubt, you can always bust out a lava lamp or a black light shining on a painting of a warrior riding on a pegasus. Again, the cliches became cliche for a reason. On the subject of lighting, let's talk about candles. As I mentioned before, my goal when I get back to the table is to have a candle I can light to signify that we are now playing the game. Then when it's time to end the game, you can lean forward and blow out the candle so everybody knows, hey, we're done. It's a simple yet very dramatic way to bring closure to the session. You can also use the candle to enhance a pivotal moment in the story. For example, if you're playing a Shadow Dark game, imagine keeping a silent torch timer behind the screen, and then, when the player's torches go out, you can blow out the candle. Sure, that probably wouldn't make the room a whole lot darker, but I still think it would be a hell of a moment. Plus, lighting a candle, and especially blowing out a candle, brings new sense into the space, which helps transport your players into the game world in a way that involves the other senses. Also, it's an unfortunate truth that sometimes, when a bunch of people sit around for a few hours, the room can develop a bit of a funk. Heck, this room smells funky whenever I work in here for more than an hour, and I'm just one dude. So lighting a candle can help combat some of these real-world odors. Now, candles don't just superficially draw comparisons to the world of a fantasy game where the residents don't have electric lighting. They also connect us to the idea of performing some sort of ritual. Whether you're prepping a birthday cake, blessing a home, or decorating for the holidays, the process of lighting a candle indicates that you're doing something special. Candles take just the tiniest bit of extra effort, and they represent that this is a special occasion, and that it should be treated with some extra attention and respect. Candles promote intimacy. And I mean, obviously that's why people do candlelight dinners or light candles in the bedroom, but that's not the sort of intimacy we're talking about today, unless your D&D group is just the right amount of freaky. But by lighting a candle at your D&D table, you're bringing everyone in to share a very intimate experience. You're using the atmosphere to ask your players to forget about everything except for the people at the table. And I also think we should highlight the fact that the flickering candle flame also evokes the idea of sitting around a fire and telling a story, tapping into some of the oldest storytelling traditions of our culture. There's something inherently special about lighting a candle before you and your friends start telling a collaborative story together. And when you connect to that, I think it automatically helps enhance the atmosphere at the table. And of course, the folks at Wicked Warlock sent me some of their candles to try. Wicked Warlock is a small fantasy candle brand started by a fantasy buff who was tired of the same old boring candles in your typical big box retail stores and wanted to create scents for hardcore fantasy fans like him. They've got double the fragrance concentration versus regular candles, which means they can give you stronger scents that fill up the room without giving you a headache. They're made with natural coconut and soy wax for a clean burning candle, and each candle burns for 40 hours, which is enough to cover at least a few months of weekly D&D sessions. They sent me the set called The Trilogy, which includes the Tavern, the Dwarven Mind, and the Elven City. The description on the label of the Elven City candle, which is written in first person, by the way, these labels feature the accounts of a traveler in a fantasy world painting pictures of the smells they're encountering, which is a really nice touch. But this label describes redwood trees and dried lavender. And I definitely smell the lavender. It kind of reminds me of beauty products or fancy shampoos. I think it's the lavender making that connection. The Dwarven Mind's flavorful description references the bowels of the earth, wooden beams, and the mountain's smoky breath. I don't really feel like this one is very strong, but that might just be me. And then the Tavern is by far my favorite. I love this smell. This description references a roaring fire and spiced honey meat, and I definitely pick up on the spice. It kind of gives me like a like a cinnamon smell, like it's spicy, but it's also sweet. It smells like something's baking. It's really good. I really like this one a lot. And if you want to pick up some candles, you can check out the link below and get 21% off of Wicked Warlock's best-selling candles. No code needed. Just check out their bundles where they sell multiple candles in packs, like the one I got, which is the Trilogy. Once again, that's 21% off of any bundle. Check out their shop by checking out the link in the description. Thank you so much to Wicked Warlock for sponsoring this video. Speaking of having physical objects at the table, you can also use props to bring the world of your game to life. I previously made a video about handouts, and there are a bunch of awesome ways to make really cool handouts for your home games, so go check that video out if you haven't already watched it. But handouts can also help your game come alive at your table, and handouts don't have to be complicated. My first GM printed out some great handouts, but other times, he just drew some really simple squiggles on a piece of paper and presented a very crude map with just the info that we needed to know. And those were fine, they did the job. 
But if you do go all out and make the paper feel like an artifact from the world of the game, then I think that makes it truly special. One thing I really want to do is get a cork board, or even just a wooden board, and use it as the job board for a tavern in game. I did that once with a cork board full of handouts, and it was awesome. The players could literally just push the papers aside and look at each one of them, just like they were living in the actual world of the game. However, because the room where we played had a huge mirror along the wall, because it was built in the 80s and it really made absolutely no effort to hide it, I could not go all the way and hang the cork board on the wall. I just had to hold it up in front of the players or lay it flat on the table. And that's something that I would really love to do right the next time I run a game in person. But even stepping away from handouts, there are other ways to incorporate props into your games. Earlier this year, I went on eBay and I bought some healing potion bottles that contain the right amount of D4 so your players can roll the dice for their healing potions without having to ask you every time how many dice they're supposed to roll and what they add to it. And look at these things, they're awesome. There's a bunch of shops that make these, but these ones came from Wooded Meadows Gaming, the link is in the description. They didn't sponsor this video, I just, I just think it's a cool product. And when you give these to your players, again, it gives them something tangible to tie them to the world of the game, and something that visually evokes the game world as well. Obviously the way your players interact with this bottle is not exactly the same way that your characters would, unless your players pour the dice into their mouth, which don't do that, not even as a joke. D4s would be the absolute worst dice to choke on, it would be the most humiliating way to die. But even though the method of using them wouldn't be exactly the same, having this prop can still bring your players into the world of the game as they can hold it in their hand and visualize carrying it on their person. Plus, having this on the table can help them remember that they've got a healing potion they can drink, which is valuable in its own right. Just like it's valuable these potions help players remember what they roll for healing when their character drinks a potion since they might not remember that rule on their own. Okay, so we've covered the things that players can see, things they can smell, and things they can hold, but what about things they can hear? So let's talk about playing music at the table. This is the one method I've used for years, probably since 2015 or so. I never used music before that because I didn't want to use movie soundtracks that would distract the players. But after seeing some of Matt Mercer's playlists that he used for Campaign 1 of Critical Role, I was able to tap into a whole world of music that actually works much better at the table, especially video game music. But I expanded on that and found a bunch of music from movies and TV that also worked really well. I used to have a great music library before my computer crashed during quarantine, so I will talk more about this in a future video. We'll talk all about specific playlists and what to look for when building your own game soundtracks. I'll show you the process of building a playlist while somehow not getting a copyright strike. I have no idea how that's going to work. But for today's purposes, it's definitely important to note that some well-placed music can do an incredible job of bringing your players into the moment. Music sets the scene and helps your players understand the emotion you're hoping they'll experience. And when you're trying to build a world with only your words, music can be a big help in making sure the moment actually comes across the way that you're hoping it does. Okay, so we've covered all the senses, except for one. Taste. Can you use taste to help set the tone and cultivate an atmosphere? Sure, why not? I mean, obviously at most games, the taste of D&D is like pizza, chips, soda, all the stuff people can eat pretty casually without distracting them from the game. But if you're willing and able, you can also use meals to draw your players deeper into the world. For example, imagine you're running the Sunless Citadel, which is all about the heroes tracking down the mysterious origin of some magical apples that have been circulating through the town. Wouldn't it just enhance the vibes of your game if you served your players an apple pie? I pulled a very similar trick with one of my games once. In an adventure inspired by Snow White, I made some apple cottage cheese pancakes for my players. They're like regular pancakes, but they are way fluffier and they've got a little hint of an apple taste to them. They're the best. I'm so hungry right now. I want one right now. And you can use your games to find any excuse to bring some good food to the table. Is your party just about to fight an ancient red dragon? Have some barbecue. Are you running a Pathfinder game set in Tianjia? Order some food appropriate to that setting. Playing Tomb of Horrors? Make cupcakes with little tombstone cupcake toppers on them, write each player character's name on each tombstone in Sharpie, and then when a character dies, they get a cupcake. Okay, maybe Tomb of Horrors doesn't normally scream cupcakes to you, but the tombstone will be a really nice touch to help them deal with the death of their player character. Like, I think this would be fun if I got one of these. I've got another video brewing about making food for your D&D games. I've got a few fantastic D&D cookbooks that were gifted by viewers on this channel. So we'll talk about this another day, but having some specific food for your game session can be a terrific way to make this game feel special and not just like some normal game night with your friends. Look, at the end of the day, each of these techniques is completely optional. You don't need each of these to build an immersive atmosphere for your games, but I would absolutely recommend you give each one of these a try. Maybe you'll discover that maybe you're not wild about using handouts, but you love other sorts of props. Maybe you don't have the energy to make meals before the game, but you love finding some really good playlists and having them run in the background during the game. Maybe you just don't want to worry about lighting, but you love bringing candles to the table. 
which once again, you can find some candles at the link below. Check it out, Wicked Warlock. But the point is, there's no one right way to create a cool atmosphere at your tables. So I suggest you experiment with each of these and see what works best for your table and for your style of play. And in fact, you might discover that your style will change as you incorporate some of these elements into your game. Like, if you decide that you actually do like using handouts, you might start making adjustments to your game so you get more excuses to include them. If you like using music at the table, you might start running more cinematic games built around big moments that you can score in advance. So give some of these a shot and let me know in the comments how they go for you. Thank you so much for watching. And once again, thank you so much to Wicked Warlock for sponsoring this video. And again, the link is in the description below for their shop, so go check them out. If you wanna support me and what I do here, the best way you can do that is by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and ringing the bell so you get notified about every new video I post. You can also support me financially through Patreon, Ko-fi, or YouTube memberships if that's a thing you want to do, and if it's within your budget. Don't do it if it's not. You can also join my Discord community to hear other ideas from other folks who love these games. There are always some great people sharing awesome ideas whenever I make one of these videos. And I've got a mailing list from my newsletter so you can stay up to date with all my latest updates. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. Click here to check out a terrific video about what I keep behind my DM screen. I think that's going to be a really useful video for you. Until next time, play fair, and have fun.